We've been considering nonverbal communication. We've looked at uh, dimensions of the voice and how those communicate nonverbally. We've talked about kinesics or body language. What we need to do, and artifacts, we want to pursue number five now in a little more depth. Uh, distance is also an interpersonal factor. Uh, uh, who's brave enough to walk up here? Anybody? Okay, Robert, come up here and stand by me for just a minute. This is a big moment on TV. Yeah, you say hi, Mom. Okay. Yeah, you say hi, Mom. If you hello, want. hello, everybody. Okay. Now notice where he stopped. Does this look like a pretty safe distance? Reach out your arm. Arm's length. Okay. You can put your arm up, but stand here for a minute. Okay. This is right on the edge of personal social distance. Okay. Depends on how long your arm is. You know, if you're Akeem Olajuwon or something, uh, this varies a little. But roughly zero to 18 inches, we consider to be intimate space. And after five days of pneumonia in the hospital, nobody's supposed to get in that range. So <laughs> however tempted you are, you know, just stay where you are. <laughs> okay, personal space is roughly 18 inches to one and a half feet or arm's length. And you have to be just in person. Yeah, you moved there on me. But you have to be just in personal range to give somebody a pat on the shoulder. Okay, you did real good. You like it up here? I like it. Okay, but you'd rather sit down. Okay, you are a great visual aid, Robert. Thank you. Okay, but he was just in arm's length. You know, but, but just a slight little move and he could be gone in a hurry. Okay, arm's length, three, depending on how long your arm is, I think it's about three feet for me but about three and a half feet. From four feet out to about 12 feet, we have social range. And that's where you're likely to find yourself if you're at a party, standing around, drinking a Coke or whatever, eating pizza, doing your thing, you know. Oh, beyond 12 feet, you're in public range, in public distance. So if, Jason, you feel like this is a public speaking situation and you back there on the back row feel more distant than usual, you could change that feeling by moving right up here on the front row and then you'd be in social range. I told him I was going to harass him, folks, because he knows how to talk and he isn't. Okay. <laughs> okay, but uh, the front row here is social. Your Lara's just out of social range uh, over here. But you know, I'm already feeling friendlier toward these people, see, and so if you want me to feel friendly toward you, well then just, you know, move on up, because that's what we do. And that's how, at least within American culture, uh, this works. Now to get within arm's length requires some kind of dispensation, some normally, some kind of permission uh, from the other person. We talked, well, I mentioned earlier that we all take a kind of space bubble around with us. You know, when you move, there's a certain amount of air and, and space that goes with you. And some of you take a little space, and some of you take a lot of space. And when you sit down at a table or at a desk, uh, you occupy space. I had a student in class one time who required a lot of space. You know, he'd come in and sit down on the back row he put his food, you know, his sweet roll and coffee or whatever on the desk on one side, his extra books on the other side, and his feet on the desk in front of him. You know, he required four desks in order to be comfortable. Okay? And if anybody sat down on that desk, at that desk in front of him, you could see the disgruntled nonverbal cues because they had invaded his space. You know, that was his territory. And anybody who came to class ought to know by observation that it required four desks to meet his needs. And so it was an invasion of space. So we all carry these bubbles around with us, and the more we like someone, the more likely we are to let them into our space. So you probably have an assortment of people that are your huggy buddies, you know, and, and those people know instantly and automatically that they have a dispensation to come into your space. In fact, there'd be something wrong if they didn't 
cross into your space and give you a hug on certain cues. There are other people who better not touch you, you know, for fear for their lives. And, and so the, the use of space also ties into the use of touch because there are some people who don't like to be touched, who don't even like pats on the shoulder uh, for whatever reasons, and it's not our job to psychoanalyze folks, but simply to recognize that there's a lot of variation in that. But I remember years ago at the coffee pot in the office, someone who's no longer on campus, so you don't have to figure, oh, who on the sixth floor of Arnold Hall is she talking about? You know, you know, that person's no longer around. But at the coffee pot, I, I said something, and I reached over uh, to touch the person on the shoulder, and the individual jumped about four inches, you know, and said, I'm really not a touchy type. I'd prefer you didn't do that. Okay. <laughs> you know, and I didn't touch that person again. Uh, you might suspect, extroverted as I am, that I am a touchy type, and generally I will pat people on the shoulder, shake hands, you know, initiate touching behavior. Oh. But you have to, touch is a very important thing. Can you think of any examples that you're aware of uh, where uh, touch deprivation has had adverse effects? Read any psych studies or anything? Well, yeah. I don't know about any particular studies, but like with the crying baby, if his mother is sitting in the same room and doesn't get picked up, that baby tends to, after a while, not want to cry or not want to do anything because he knows he's not going to get any attention. He feels unloved. Okay. And, and the way to get the baby to stop crying is to pick him up and pat him and pack him around endlessly. I mean, sometimes they're hungry or wet or, you know, need immediate needs, but sometimes what they want is somebody to touch them. Okay, other instances or examples you think of? I think there's a classic um, study where they had um, orphans and uh, infants mm -hmm. in a hospital and one wing they were dying at, I guess a normal rate, whatever was, was their normal thing, which was fairly sad, and they had one wing where the babies were doing much better and they tried to figure out what was different and ultimately found out that the only difference was a cleaning woman who would come in who cleaned that one wing and when she, while she was working, she would take turns picking up one of the babies and carrying it around yeah. with her while she cleaned. And those babies were living. That's a neat story, isn't it? I hadn't read that one. I'm, I'm thinking of another I'll share with you in a moment. But that's nice. What were you thinking? I was thinking about pets and animals. <coughs> if um, an owner of a pet doesn't pick it up or <coughs> pet or touch the animal, when visitors come over, Either that dog or whatever will bark or bite or run away, go into the bed. Mm -hmm. They're not used to being it. And if a visitor tries to touch, then they get really, they're not used to okay. it. Okay. I'm thinking of, of some of the uh, articles I've read, but I'm, you know, they're kind of back there lost in the memory bank, but of children that have been locked away in closets for months or years and they're just really messed up. They may not even um, be able to speak. You know, they have all sort of, uh, sorts of deprived social skills and, and personal needs and so forth. And then I'm thinking also kind of related to the story you're sharing, uh, where they matched up uh, men and women from a nursing home who came in to rock the babies. And the, the elderly folks were bored and didn't have enough to do, and this particular hospital had uh, lots of babies that needed TLC. And so that was just a wonderful job to, you know, get some volunteers to sit there in the rocking chairs and rock the babies. Go ahead. I thought of another classic one was the example of, I think they had some, took some infant monkeys and gave them a choice of, they had sort of just a wire structure, very cold kind of thing, mother, but that's where they could get milk. And then they had a warm, uh, well, maybe not warmer, but certainly soft and fuzzy mother to kind of just cling to. Mm -hmm. And the babies would, and these little infant monkeys would leave <coughs> the soft, fuzzy <coughs> thing just long enough to get some food, and then would immediately go back to that one. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Well, this, this is what this is all about, the idea of touch and the notion that in order to give warm fuzzies, to give uh, uh, supportive touching communication, you've got to be in intimate range. I mean, you know, if, if you've ever tried, well, I don't know about you guys, you know, but women occasionally end up in situations where they're wearing big corsages. And if you've ever tried to hug 
another person who's wearing a big corsage, you do this really strange maneuver, okay? Uh, that's not the way hugs were meant to be. You know, that's, that's a distorted form of hugging. Uh, so in order to really hug somebody, to show somebody that you care, to have your most special uh, personal relationships with someone, requires that you be in that intimate range. Okay, one of the problems that uh, hospital patients often have is a lack of touch. I mean, they come in, they take your blood pressure, they take your temperature, and now the thermometer even has a shield on it, you know, so they can trash that. You, you at least could have a personal relationship with your thermometer once upon a time. Oh, but except to check your pulse or, or poke around and listen on you, that doesn't really count as touch. And so persons who may, who may find themselves in uh, hospitals for extended periods of time may end up uh, touch starved, touch deprived compared to what they are generally accustomed to. And I've talked with nurses who uh, have to adapt their touching behavior because as we were saying earlier there are appropriate and inappropriate ways to touch. So if you've got a patient you know who's bed fast uh, what are the appropriate ways to touch? You don't generally, only unless you're a friend of the person, you don't go over hugging them uh, in the hospital. But if you're a volunteer or a routine acquaintance, uh, what kinds of things can you do to touch? Or can you touch? Yeah, be brave. Okay. You want to? It depends on the uh, patient, but I think that, like I said earlier, the arm or um, <clears throat> the hair. Okay, hair is moving one notch in. That's a little, you can kind of pat somebody on top of the head or, or fix their hair. Uh, that's the same thing, but to stroke hair is a more personal thing. I'm thinking of one nurse I know who's, or I guess, well she worked at the hospital, she wasn't actually a nurse, but she worked at the hospital and she said she was a foot patter. You know, uh, she wasn't comfortable enough going in. She worked in discharge planning at a major hospital. And so she frequently went in to talk with patients, you know, about their treatment plans when they were going home. And she wasn't comfortable enough to touch them on the arm. She might shake hands with them. But anyway, in her particular case, and this is a person who used to be a cheerleader at a major university, so she didn't lack for uh, extroversion and social skills. But she found that uh, standing near the foot of the bed and patting the patient's foot or ankle, I mean not pat, 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 you know, but an occasional touch uh, in that area turned out to be a safe zone. Yeah. Now all of us have to work through what works for us. But our point here is we're looking at how interpersonal distance and or touch are working together to communicate messages. And if you're really concerned about someone, then you're probably going to move into personal range. You know, if I look over and, and Nancy is crying, I can, I can look at her from here and say, gee, Nancy, what's wrong? Well, that's pretty impersonal. But if I'm willing to move over to her, at least in touching range, in range to hand her a Kleenex, a tissue, or whatever, I've reduced that interpersonal distance. Okay, we don't want to beat this to death. All right, talk about environmental factors for a moment. How does the environment affect you? Robert, and then we'll come back over. Just noticed how, uh, like a rainy day, uh, where the, the, it's real uh, dark and rainy, stormy day, people tend to be more depressed, more somber, um, people I interact with, and okay. sometimes myself. So that's, I okay, some people are very vulnerable to the weather, aren't they? I had a drama major for a roommate in college, and she made it a special point on gloomy days to wear the brightest thing in the closet that she had because she was this burst of sunshine and energy and wonderfulness wherever she went. Uh, but unless you're making a conscious effort to offset that, uh, you may find that the gloomy permeates to you. What were you thinking, Nancy? Decorators will tell you like the color of the room, like blue would be more of a peaceful kind of situation. Are we talking sky blue here or, or royal pale blue? blue? Pale blue. Know, perhaps, and then more of the 
warm colors would, you know, be more of a cozy atmosphere. Okay, yeah. And then, the like, right. the green is more of the regal, kind of formal. Okay, which green? The Pea hunter. Green, or, hunter green. Yeah. Okay. Uh, name some more colors and what they do or don't do for you. I forgot your name. I know I'm... Jilly, yes, thank you. Hospitals. You know, they're always stark white and as far as maybe a regular room goes, but if you get a private room, you'll notice they may have like an armoire to hang your clothes in or it's a single bed and it has a nice pretty coverlet on it. And yeah, I had a lovely hospital room last week. You know, it had this... I guess that was wallpaper around the top, but it was... It was powder blue and mauve and, oh, aren't these nice colors, you know? For, and that's good for what the insurance company was paying for that room. Uh, it wasn't antiseptic hospital white. But it, but it was nice. It had a nice big window with a pleasant view of some green grass. It made me want to get out. <laughs> yes, and then we'll come back up. Um, speaking back of decorators, there was a, a fad for home you know, I think I think there's colors that go through as far as what's fashionable, and I think about 20 years ago, what was terribly fashionable was like um, green and harvest gold, and we had Are a house, avocado green. Yes, and I oh. had a house that. Had, well, mine was avocado green and pink. We went through that phase, and and my husband had been in the Marine Corps and had real associations for any shade of green that remotely resembled um, Marine Corps green, and avocado did not go over well. <clears throat> okay, uh, think about restaurants for a minute. Uh, describe the environment of a fast food restaurant. What color is it going to be? What kind of furniture is it going to have? Okay. They use, in fact, I've read studies on this, so I know. They use red and orange because they want you in and out fast. Okay. Because they make their money in high volume, and the furniture is not comfortable. Okay, people, there are manufacturers that actually design uncomfortable furniture, besides the desk that you sit in and some of these other classrooms. Uh, there, there's furniture that's designed to put kinks in your body after 10 or 15 minutes. So I'm told. I can't document that one, folks, but I believe it from sitting there. Lara? Well, I was thinking about the lighting. The lighting in a fast food place is always fluorescent and bright, and does it make you want to linger as opposed to the lighting in a fancy restaurant? It's muted, candles, makes you want to sit down and relax, take your time. Okay, if you're paying, yeah, you're, you're right. Fast food is going to be orange and yellow or orange and green or red, and uh, but those bright, intense, keep moving kinds of colors. If you're paying 30 bucks a head for dinner, if you can remember when you did that sometime. <laughs> what do you expect in terms of ambiance? Like flowers at your table and small candles and tablecloth. And okay, nice I don't want chair. just one <laughs> tablecloth, I want two. I want one that's on and then the other one that goes the other way. You know, so it's a double layer, so if you drop the fork, you'd, you know, no sound. Okay, what color should the carpet be? Okay, probably dark, a maroon or but something in a very professional, and it has to be plush. Okay, it's got to have wonderful ambiance, doesn't it? The only time I paid 30 bucks a pop, there was a view of the Golden Gate Bridge out the window. You know, we were up about 40 stories or whatever. But it was worth it. See, I will remember that dinner forever. And I wasn't paying for the food, I was paying for the environment and for the right to sit there for two or three, I think we stayed about two or two and a half hours. And to have somebody pop over and refill the water glass every time we took a sip. You know, those little niceties. But you're paying for the ambiance. And you're, you're screening out other clientele, too. Anybody can go through a fast food restaurant. You know, only certain people sometimes, some people go to $30 a pop all the time. And some of us only get there occasionally. Okay, but, but the environment is very different. The color changes, the climate changes, and whether it's potted plants or wonderful flowers or uh, real china on the table. I remember one person, a uh, young lady, the first time she ever went to a restaurant that required that her date wear a suit. You know, the, the former love in her life had, had lived in jeans with holes in them. 
And uh, this fellow took her out to dinner and wore a suit. And she came home and she went, well, it's a daughter, you figured that one out. But anyway, uh, she came home and she said, there was real china on the table. <laughs> you know, we drank out of real glasses and so forth. Okay, the environmental factors are important. And we'll see this as we get into uh, different contexts. And those things are more important to some people than they are to others. It may be more important to a person to be battered and stay in a multi-million dollar home than it is to not be battered and move into a shelter. Uh, the, the way the environment changes when the primary breadwinner loses a job and the whole economic status of a family is disrupted and, and turned upside down and you know a family moves from a four bedroom home into an apartment or you're in a health crisis situation, you're in a hospital context, we'll be seeing from time to time how those things change. Okay, just kind of some generalizations and closure on this particular part. You want to listen to what is not said. It's important to watch for deviations from what you know is normal. And the better you know a person, uh, the better you are able to uh, assess where that person's coming from. You know, if this is normally a bubbly, extroverted, uh, happy individual, and then they're having a real quiet day, you've got some clues that there may be uh, something wrong may be occurring. And on the other hand, if you've got a rather quiet person who today is just, you know, can't wipe the smile off their face and is more talkative than usual, uh, that's good and it would be appropriate to uh, find out what's going on there. And just remember, watch for deviations from normal and know that the nonverbal messages will normally override the verbal messages. And that's important. Okay, we've done all of this now to establish and get some parameters on what communication is. Now we want to talk about what a crisis is. Off the top of your head, what would you say is a crisis? Got a clue? Okay. Something that deserves immediate attention, um, immediate uh, response. Response and correction. Okay, you're on the right track. We're going to draw some lines. I'm going to put up a kind of, of um, three stage model here, and then we're going to go back and look at these part by part and talk about <coughs> some specific crises. But the first thing you need to do is clarify the crisis, and this is a basic intervention uh, model. You want to clarify the crisis, and if the situation needs it, you want to stabilize the situation, and ultimately you want to develop some sort of an action plan so if it was an avoidable crisis, you can avoid having it happen again. But you're going to see these three terms come up uh, several times in the next portion of our discussion. But you want to clarify the crisis, stabilize the situation, <clears throat> and develop an action plan. Now before we sort out just what a crisis is, there are two terms that we just kind of need to talk about. And these are mobility and lethality. <coughs> <coughs> Mobility, well, what do you think, got any idea what I mean by mobility? Mm. Okay, can this person function? You know, some people are in shock. And you may walk in, on, you know, maybe a person gets a phone call and you, the next door and you hear, oh, no. And, and your senses tell you something is wrong. You know, and, and so you step in there and the person just kind of, sitting there blanked out. Maybe they've hung up the phone and you say, what's wrong? What's going on? And they're just, okay. Uh, maybe they, you know, they're getting bad news of some sort. But mobility has to do with whether or not the person is mobile. Can they function in this situation? Uh, mobility may also uh, refer to physical elements. Are they so injured? that they're immobile or unconscious, and we'll come to more of that in just a minute. 
but are they in shock? Are, are they mobile or not? And, and it's usually a scale from fully mobile to totally immobile and unconscious. But that's a term you'll need to hold on to throughout the semester. <coughs> okay, lethality has to do with... Yeah, how dangerous is this person? Some dude comes through that door firing a gun. They're lethal. Unless it's blanks, but I'm not taking any chances. You know, uh, it, does this person really appear to be suicidal? Are they lethal to themselves? Are they lethal to other people? But part of your assessment of the situation uh, in determining do we have a crisis or do we just have a little problem here uh, has to do with uh, the lethality of the individual, whether they're likely to hurt themselves, whether they're likely to hurt other people. So those terms will come up uh, from time to time. Okay, and we're going to make a distinction in here, and I like continuums, you know, because things usually aren't uh, just black or white, crisis or not a crisis. We'll also see, too, that what's a crisis for one person won't be for someone else. Uh, Ginger's husband repairs computers. He loves it when computers break down, okay, because he gets to go fix them, and people pay him money to fix them. Uh, but for most of us, you know, if the computer crashes, if the paper won't even feed through the printer right, uh, that's a little mini crisis. It's not a crisis by the definition uh, that I'm going to work with because I've learned how to put the paper back into the printer. I just don't like doing it. You know, but the day the power drive went out on my Mac in the office, I put that over in the crisis column, but fortunately there was somebody who knew what to do about that, you know, and in a few days they had it repaired and all the data was there, and so all was well that ended well. But we're going to look at this as a kind of continuum of an emergency at one end, crisis being somewhere in this middle range, depending on your point of view and how you define it, and then urgency being down here at the other end. And an urgency, I think of as those situations where we got a little problem developing here, and if we don't hurry up and figure out what to do about it, it could turn into a crisis. You know, if I'm giving an exam the next day and discover that all the page threes are missing, well, 24 hours ahead of an exam, uh, that's still manageable, but I need to hurry up and get it fixed. Okay, the fuel light comes on your car. On the way home, Jason's shaking. Jason's communicating non-verbally. Good boy, Jason. <laughs> okay. Fuel light comes on. That's an urgency, particularly for Jason because he lives in Baytown. You know, uh, my car won't make it to Baytown with the fuel light on. Uh, but it's not a crisis yet, unless Jason doesn't have any money, and then it might be a crisis. Okay. So, so we're sort of looking at a continuum here. There's some things that are urgent that need to be taken care of that we need to pay attention to so that they don't turn into crises. And then there are other things that very clearly belong down on the emergency end of the continuum. And as we said earlier, we're not psychotherapists, we're not paramedics, and so it's important that we know when this is an emergency, when the thing that you most need to do is pick up the phone and call 911. Okay, it's not time to mess around. You can't fix it. Uh, you know, a lot of us have had some basic uh, CPR training, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, but you need to know when this is something that you, as a care provider, can do something about and when you can't. So, okay, how do you know when it's an emergency? you can't guess, I'll tell you in a minute. How, how would you decide whether or not you need, that the first thing you need to do is call 911? Okay, here, and then we'll come up. Well, one would be, um, looking back at the previous things, if you're hitting something that's uh, real high on the lethality scale, that's emergency. Okay, high lethality for the person or others. Good. What are you thinking? 
I was on the same track, a life-threatening situation. <clears throat> okay, um, is this life-threatening? Robert? If you're not trained to deal with the life-threatening situation, like if, if it's a, for example, if you're not a psychiatrist <coughs> or if you're not an EMT person, mm -hmm. then you, you'd want to call uh, someone who could help you. That would be an emergency situation, I would guess. Um, okay, what kinds of things might cause you to call 911? You come up on a person, you come in, you walk into this room and encounter a person that you think is in crisis. Um, but how are you going to know whether they're in an emergency or a crisis? You have to evaluate their situation, try to speak with them. Okay, what are you looking for? Response. Okay, yeah, I'm going to get you there. I have to get your brain, so it's getting late at night here. <laughs> Verbal and nonverbal cues from that from the okay. person. Okay, if, if I look at you and say, are you okay? And you go, that's a clue. There's something wrong here. Or if you're stretched out on the floor, Julie? Maybe it's progressed far enough and there may be sight of blood. And oh, and okay, we got you on the somewhere. right track here. Let's look at some of these. The person may be unconscious. If I go, are you okay, and start shaking your body, which is down there on the floor, you know, you might just be taking a nap, <laughs> waiting for class to start. Or you got really bored and fell out of your chair, and there you are. You know. uh, but we, find, we come in, and we find this person on the floor. And so we shake them and say, are you okay? You need some help? and they don't answer, or they're sitting in a chair in a stupor, and, and we determine that the individual is either unconscious or in shock. We can put that over at the emergency end. Okay, somebody mentioned bleeding. If there's excessive bleeding, well, what's excessive bleeding? I don't know. Depends on what you're able to uh, to deal with. You know, the young lady the other day nearly passed out from a tablespoon of blood. Uh, but, you know, pretty, if this is something that needs stitches, if this person needs to go to the hospital, uh, if they're not going to bleed to death in the next few minutes, then you may be able to put them in the car and take them and it's just a crisis. But <clears throat> if this is something uh, that requires major bandaging and surgery and whatever and ambulance transport, <coughs> So sometimes the line is a little bit uh, hazy there, but it's a judgment call on your part. If, if in your opinion and the individual's opinion, and maybe you need to ask them, you know, you want me to call an ambulance? Can, or can we get you to the car? What should, what should we do here? But excessive bleeding is a good clue uh, that this is an emergency. Okay, breathing difficulties. Now some of you are, are trained to do body thrusts and Heimlich maneuvers and uh, these things. But uh, if you've got a person for whatever reason who is uh, having continued difficulty in breathing, and how will you know if somebody's having trouble breathing? <laughs> they can't talk. Okay, they probably can't talk to you. There's going <gasps> to uh, you know, they'll be making some horrible, rasping, uh, painful breathing attempts. Odds are. Okay, anything that requires an immediate kind of response, it can't wait. You know, if this can wait an hour or two, it's probably not an emergency. But if an immediate response is required, and unconscious or bleeding or uh, breathing difficulties, uh -oh. <clears throat> any of those may give you reason for that. <coughs> Okay, it's not an emergency. We're a st we're, we've, we've sorted that out. We've pushed that over to the side. What we've got here is a crisis. Okay, and we said step one in our model was that we wanted to clarify the crisis. And we'll be talking about types just a minute. But first of all, we've got to go ahead and figure out then what is a crisis. And this takes us back to perception, which is why we needed to uh, look at, zoom in a little more, here we go. 
uh, takes us back to that communication model and how we said that meaning is in the mind of the receiver. And if you perceive it to be a crisis, then it counts as a crisis. The rest of us may go, that's not a crisis. But if you think it's a crisis, then you're going to act like it's a crisis. And one part of our definition of crisis is that it's a perceived intolerable difficulty. It's, it's something that we lack the coping skills uh, to adequately respond to. Let's look at several of these things here. <coughs> we may feel that our personal coping skills have been exhausted. I've tried this, I've tried that, I simply don't know what else to do. I've tried this approach, I've tried that approach, nothing seems to be working. You know, I'm trying to get this computer to do thus and so, and it just won't do it, because I forgot the crucial command. Or I've tried to persuade another person to stop drinking, to study harder, to not leave home, to not take back the engagement ring, you know, whatever it may be. It may be people or it may be things. Uh, but, but we're running out of personal resources. Our coping skills have been exhausted in this situation. And that makes it increasingly difficult. Okay, there's both danger and opportunity present. If there isn't, if the crisis isn't resolved, then it could turn into an emergency, or at least there is some sort of inherent significant danger. Okay? But at the same time, uh, your text and other books will say inherent in any crisis is an opportunity. You know, if you're getting a divorce, there's an opportunity to start a new life, to do new things, to uh, pursue differently. If, if you flunk out of one major and you have to get into another major, uh, that may be a crisis, but it also, you know, it has a danger in it that you might not graduate, but it also has inherent in it an opportunity uh, for you to develop and become better and so forth. Uh, you think of my little medical episode, there was any opportunity? You know, I went in, I went in the emergency room. It wasn't a total emergency. It was a, a super urgency. I just wasn't sure I could last the rest of the night coughing my head off with no sleep at all. You know, and so the way to get admitted to the hospital promptly is to go into the emergency room. Um, but it, it wasn't life-threatening at that point. I sat home another couple of days, it might have been. Uh, there was some danger there. But in, in being admitted to the hospital, there was also an opportunity. And so I tried to tell myself, well, gee, this is just going to be a new great big adventure, and I'm just going to learn so many things, because I've, I've only been in the hospital three times, and that was to have children, and that was 20 years ago. Okay? So to be a real patient was a novel experience. And the head nurse and I had an interesting discussion about that. You know, she told me, for example, that patients needed to get into bed. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. You know, well, if you'll tell me how to be a patient, I'll try to be one. Because I've never been a patient before. You know, and, and a patient is a role. A nurse is a role. A doctor is a role that's played. And, and a patient is supposed to do certain things. And, and when we get to that unit, we'll look at those things more in depth. So, gee, here, you know, in my pain and agony and lack of sleep was this great opportunity uh, to discover what it's like to be a patient. I was also near the nurse's station, too, and that was interesting. Okay, but a crisis has both danger and opportunity. Okay, it's usually time limited. Uh, the crisis will pass within a certain period of time. Something will happen <coughs> that resolves that situation. For some people, if they lock their keys in their car, it's a crisis. Uh, for most of us, it's at least an urgency. We need to do something about it. Some of you, though, have a second key stashed somewhere because you lock your keys in the car all the time anyway, and you've learned to plan ahead and take primary intervention, and you know how to deal with that. 
you know, and uh, on campus, I just, I've only locked mine in once, but I trust the campus cops to be able to come over and get the car open and, you know, get the keys out, whatever. We also come to a term, though, called trans crisis, <coughs> excuse me, which says that there are some crises that keep emerging over time, you know, really traumatic events that happen to an individual uh, may get so embedded in the person that they're triggered again under certain situations. Robert. Is that like the post-traumatic stress? Okay, yeah, PTSD, which post-traumatic stress syndrome, which we'll talk about later on, is something refers to people who've experienced traumas at such a level that they don't get over them. You know, it's one thing to be a hero or a heroine in a San Francisco earthquake. And it's something else to watch blood dripping out of collapsed freeways and, you know, dismembered body parts and, and things like that. And when your adrenaline is pumping and you're in the middle of that emergency or crisis situation, you can do a whole lot of things that are noble and wonderful. I worry about these two ladies that pulled the children out of the burning school bus the other day. That was wonderful, and, and, you know, it's an incredible response that they were able to do that. I hope they're going to be okay, you know, that they aren't going to wake up nights from now with visions of flames. Fortunately, the children got out okay, and that should help all of this res resolve. But had some of the children not survived, uh, that would have made it even more traumatic. But post-traumatic stress syndrome says that we've been through a Vietnam War, we've been through an earthquake, we've been through some terrible kind of event. And now after the fact, this notion of trans crisis is occurring, trans meaning across time, <clears throat> that over time the crisis keeps popping up. You know, if, if any of you do yard work, and I don't do much, but I've noticed there's some things growing out there that send out these runners that when you least expect it, a berry bush pops up in a new place. You know, this stuff called American Beauty that I thought was so wonderful, I now discover has, you know, confiscated half of my yard with uh, runners and so forth. Well, a trans crisis is kind of like that. It's, it's, the problem is embedded in the person. And so it, it will pop up and, and it'll get triggered at the most unusual time. And when we get to PTSD, we'll look at some things like flashbacks, uh, nightmares, some things that, that bring those uh, memories back into effect. But a crisis may go either way. It may be time limited <clears throat> so that you get over it and it gets resolved. Or it may be something that keeps reemerging at different points in time and has to be dealt with. Uh, subsequently. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and cover the rest of this. Uh, is this. Is the crisis simple or complex? <clears throat> uh, some things are short, immediate, um, the pot's boiling over all over the stove, you need to take care of that, it's making a mess, it could burn somebody, but you know, within minutes you may have the fire turned off, the pot removed, and be proceeding to clean up the mess. And so that was a little relatively simple crisis. But then there are other things that are much more uh, complex. <clears throat> you may have uh, a child with cancer that has to be hospitalized for months, and one of the parents needs to move into the hospital and stay with that child, and there are other children left at home. You know, and, and then you get a whole, we'll look next week at systems theory and this rippling spinoff interdependent uh, kind of effect. Oh, but some crises are very complex and it takes a while to resolve them. They're not easily resolved and uh, we just want to be aware of that. <clears throat> One of the things you'll be asking in a crisis situation, and you'll hear this theme uh, over and over this semester, is how many choices do you have? You know, last week when uh, I, I wasn't in the hospital at airtime last week, but I probably should have been. 
you know, and, and a few hours before that we were in contact, well actually the day before, we were in contact with the director of the program saying, okay, how many choices do we have? You know, I can come in here and try croaking my way through the show, uh, the program, and, and perhaps make it or not. Uh, we can try to have Ginger punt and do the first lecture, and she wasn't real fond of that on 24 hours notice. You know. And uh, finally, Professor Freydan said, well, why don't we just put a sign up that says, crisis communication is having a crisis. <laughs> and so in effect, that's what they did, and uh, we delayed the broadcast for a week. Uh, we will be letting you know next week whether or not we're going to do an additional We have to do something to make up for the three hours that you all got to goof off next week while I was at death's door. Uh, we're not sure yet if we're going to do an additional tape and just let you uh, check it out of the library upstairs and view that or if it will be aired and we'll tell you when it will air and you can tape it and so forth. So just kind of stay tuned uh, for that when we're thinking through uh, the parameters of that. But we'll be looking at choices and often what you'll be doing in a situation is helping the person determine how many choices they have uh, for dealing with that particular situation. Okay, what do you think this next one means? It's your turn to talk. When we say a crisis can be a catalyst for change. You may not be aware that there's ever a problem, for example, um, in my own personal history, you know, my father was always like this great, wonderful person, you know, he's your dad, you know, you're supposed to care for him. but. When he started, you know, abusing one of my sisters, it became a point where he's not that anymore, you know, and I need to leave or take my sisters out, you know. You have to decide, is this something I want to stay in or is this something <coughs> that needs to change for the better? Self-preservation. Okay, good. Anything else come to mind? Okay, go ahead. When I uh, returned to college as a single parent, <laughs> um, I had these grand ideas of being a business major, thinking that this would be terribly, um, uh, would, would be the uh, smart thing to do because I'd make lots of money that way. And when I failed to uh, successfully navigate um, the, uh, some of the math courses required for that, that was the catalyst to persuade me that I needed to return to something that came easier to me. Okay, good. Yeah, you just may find, you know, uh, when people divorce, it, it forces whichever one leaves the other or whether it's mutual or whatever, it forces people into new lifestyles. When a family member dies, whether it's expected or unexpected, uh, it's likely to produce changes within that family unit. Mm -hmm. When a family member may come down with a certain disease or disorder, um, you can, it can be a catalyst for you to change your own behavior to prevent certain things, to, same, the same things happening to you or your siblings or family members. Okay, good. <clears throat> and a crisis may produce emotional chaos. I wasn't chaotic last week, but uh, Ginger's rolling her eyes back there, but I was pretty stressed. I was pretty annoyed. I'm a high control person who likes things done my way, on my schedule, you know. And these germs were just really annoying. You know, they cramped my lifestyle. And that's nothing compared to a major illness that keeps you in a hospital for months, losing your job, losing someone close to you. I mean, there are all kinds of things that are much worse. But there is likely to be emotional chaos in the situation. And so any combination <clears throat> and most of these things we're likely to find working together in a crisis situation. Okay, we want to clarify the crisis. And one, we're looking to determine, is this a crisis? <coughs> <coughs> and pretty much from here on, we'll be assuming that this is a crisis rather than an urgency or an emergency, uh, knowing that, I mean, for our purposes of discussion in the course, that for some people this would just be an urgent situation and they'd pay a little more attention 
and so forth. But assuming we've got something that somewhere out here goes within these parameters of crisis, we're going to classify them into three categories. <coughs> and you get to help classify some of these tonight. The some, there's that L, okay. Some crises we would consider to be situational, others we'd consider to be maturational, or you could call them developmental crises. They go with a, a particular point in your life. And then a third type is existential, which has to do with your uh, value systems, uh, your uh, beliefs. You know, something happens that shakes up your belief system. Okay, think of an example, and it can be real or hypothetical, it can be yours or someone else's, and if you will, uh, give me an example and tell me whether you would classify it as situational or maturational or existential. Have you ever seen the movie When a Man Loves a Woman and she starts to drink? Um, when they go out to dinner, when they go out to eat, she, she gets really giddy from all the things that <coughs> she does. Uh, and he never really notices it. He doesn't think anything of it mm -hmm. until finally she breaks down and, and starts drinking behind his back, underneath the bed and stuff. And finally she falls out of the shower because she's in a drunken stupor. And that's when he realizes that at this point, you know, her drinking is, is a serious crisis that he never knew was developing because he never noticed the signs. He wasn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. wasn't watching those nonverbal signs. Okay. In that situation, when a man loves a woman, uh, which, one, which type of crisis are we dealing with here? Could be maturational development. <clears throat> Is this a function of age? Mm, no, it might be. Oh, well, I guess it might be her situation. Okay. I probably put it in the situation. The, the relationship has matured. The relationship has developed. But it's the situation that's uh, probably creating the crisis. Okay, something else coming to mind. Okay? If you're in a restaurant and you don't have money to pay for your dinner, that would be situational. <laughs> yes. And probably more than urgent, right? Get there no money in the wallet or the wallet is missing. Okay, that's a situational crisis. Meryl? Um, to me, an existen existential crisis would be if you maybe found out your... <clears throat> what you thought your um, committed parents, maybe one parent cheating on the other, and it just shakes up your whole commitment belief. Okay, the, the question is your whole trustworthiness of that individual. Okay. One that I think seems to fit both categories, and that's like death of a person, a major person in your life, um, that's certainly a situation <clears throat> But for a lot of people, it also becomes an existential thing because now that's frequently when people start really thinking about, you know, is there a God? Is, it, is this person gone somewhere? You know, what do I feel about this? Okay, good. And we're going to find that there are times when these things overlap. And it will impact. We said earlier in the communication process, we have to look at how many people there are and, and how many people are affected in this situation. And you know, if this is an aged individual, if you're 94, then or you know, 100 or whatever, whatever number you want to pick for you, uh, this is one of your maturational crises. You know, you have to die to get off this planet, or to get under the dirt and but wherever it is you believe you're going uh, when you die. But but one of your maturational crises is death, and that may be a situational crisis for the people around you who are having to cope with that personal loss and it may be an existential crisis as you're saying for folks who have now who, who have never had anyone close to them die before and they're having to do and to deal with that okay. would the back row like to share something back there they is remembering the no fear shirt that says it's not that life is so short it's that death is so long oh yeah that was a shirt my daughter had on today yeah, even if I'd known what you were saying to me I couldn't have gotten that slogan out anyway uh, but yeah death death's a real long deal 
It's rather permanent, as far as we know. You know, we get one small little unit on near-death experiences later on. Yeah, Nancy. Um, perhaps uh, situational and a maturational would be if a single parent remarries and there's ch there's a child involved and they may have a hard time dealing with the fear or the loss, whatever the situation, and may act out in some way, you know, inappropriate mm -hmm. way in their behavior. Good. I want to add another one. Okay, we'll be pursuing these in more length and variety. <coughs> Next week, we're probably going to bring some examples in and uh, share some real things with you, let you classify those. I want to work us on through all three phases of our model uh, before we finish tonight. Okay, we said that once we clarify that there is a crisis, uh, we also whoops, want to be able to stabilize the situation. Okay, now how are you going to stabilize a situation? You come up on this car wreck, uh, the, the light poles knocked over, the windshields crashed out, the driver's kind of slumped over but doesn't seem to be bleeding. Uh, the other people are running around like crazy people going, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and somebody runs to call 911. What are you going to do? Okay. Would you prioritize the victims, like the one that's probably hurting the most in the situation, go to that person first? Okay, good. We're going to come to the word triage later on. If you've ever gone to the emergency room, as I did with a low-level emergency, I was number 13 on the list of 13. Okay, I had permission to stay there, but, you know, my, and my daughters who'd had to get up in the middle of the night and drive were saying, boy, you know, we hope we get to see a gunshot victim or something, and I'm saying, no, they'll never let me in, you know, if they come in with, with a gunshot wound or, or you know, uh, some gang that's <laughs> torn on five or six people up at once. Okay, you need to stabilize the situation. What are you going to do when, when you first come up on a situation? Go ahead. You would have to try and figure out what could at least stop it from moving towards, because a lot of things crisis looks to me like are, things where they have the potential to go on to emergency if something doesn't stop what's there. Okay, maybe this is a fender bender on loop 610. Okay, do we have an emergency or a crisis? It's only a crisis as long as you're not in the, you don't have lethality potential here. So you need to get yourself like out of the traffic lane so yeah. people don't come along and run you over or not. Or yeah. Cars. yeah, American Red Cross will tell you first, check the scene. Now, I planted this down light pole for you and nobody picked up the cue. You know, are there some power lines down? Look, look around. See what's going on here before you just plunge right in. Uh, what, what is a typical example of where there's an emergency situation and another person goes right in and suffers the same fate? High water and flooding in Houston. Okay, what drowning. Well, yeah, I mean, same thing. Oh, yeah. well, I'm, thinking about the, I'm just thinking classic thing of there's a car in the water and you can't tell how deep it is and people are invariably following it after and just flood out all their engines right in a row. Okay. I'm, I'm thinking about, though, where one person jumps in to rescue someone who's drowning and they believe they can swim. I know I can't. I mean, I can't swim well enough to rescue me. So, you know, my instinct's going to be to look around for a pole or a anything that will help you know but if you believe you can swim you've been trained as a lifeguard or you just know that you're a good swimmer your instinct is probably to jump in and sometimes that's okay and sometimes it's not and I don't always know where the the line is you know if, if it's your swimming pool in the backyard and you believe you can rescue people you might be able to handle that if it's the bio over here and the currents really moving in flood waters, you know, you're just both going to go under. And so, checking the scene, stabilizing the situation, being aware, you know, are, are you going to put more people at risk if you don't pay attention to what you're doing? Are you going to put yourself at such risk 
that then you become useless as a caregiver, okay? An example, we were cooking the other day, uh, cooking french fries, you know, frying french fries, and one of the french fries fell onto the stove and started a fire, a mm -hmm. fire. And my instinct was just to grab water because fire, you know, but if I had thrown wa water on it, it would have made it worse than throwing salt or sh sugar or flour, you know, other than that, because it would, it would have completely just blown up in everybody's face if I had thrown water mm -hmm. you know, without thinking. Okay. And how much fire can one French fry make? A lot. <laughs> a lot? <laughs> I mean, yeah, did it, it make a pretty, pretty high. Big I mean, it was pretty high, but if I had thrown water on it, it would have been worse. <clears throat> Okay, but there are some things, I mean, I, you know, it, it, I get a little grease splatter now. There's some things, you see, leave them alone, let them burn up. You know, or if you have a lid and can put that on, you know, there's several things uh, you can do. But if you, if you overreact to that situation, you may make it worse by doing the wrong thing than not doing anything at all. And so part of stabilizing the situation may mean you know, checking the scene, seeing if there are power lines down, seeing if, if 911 should be called, do we have an emergency, or is there something that you can do? Okay, we've sent somebody off to call 911. Okay, what are you going to do next? You, you've got, we're doing a fender bender on 610. You've got somebody uh, out there directing traffic or, you know, detour, diverting traffic, then what? Nancy? It seems like there's always someone to calm down or to reassure during a crisis. You know, somebody's upset. Okay. Probably going to go over and talk to the victims. Would that be appropriate? Okay. Uh, I've got get information here. This may ultimately be what you're doing, but one of the things you're doing in stabilizing is having this calm, reassuring effect. Uh, maybe you're going to, if, if it seems reasonable to do so, you may be touching the person's hand, touching their shoulder, but at least in calm, vocal tones, you're going to be saying to the person, help is on the way, somebody's already gone to get help, uh, maybe, what, well, you tell me, what else would you do? Okay, Robert? Uh, there was a situation where there was a car wreck in front of us one time, and I was, drive I was riding with my mother, and <clears throat> this woman who had the car was in the car wreck, she was like totally hysterical. And my mother got out of the car, and the first thing she did was she hugged her, and then she started getting information about her name and stuff like that, and then started asking her questions that would try to get her mind off the subject, kind of like, and to reassure her that everything's going to... Yeah. So I guess what would be try to um, um, assess... I guess she would... Um, Divert their attention away from the crisis so that you can calm them down and then go back to um, the crisis at hand, I guess. Okay, you might get them thinking about some normal kinds of things to just kind of get them back in perspective. Depends on how badly they're injured, okay? If this is, a, are you thinking something? Okay. Uh, if this is a person who is potentially unconscious, uh, likely to become unconscious, then, uh, you know, get whatever information you can before the paramedics arrive. What, I mean, you can search the person's wallet, or, I mean, not you, the uh, paramedics can get wallets and uh, that kind of information. But, you know, you might ask this person their name and use their name when you talk to them. Uh, where do you work? Do you have a preference on which hospital you go to? You know, when the EMTs get here, they're probably going to want to take you to the hospital. you got a pretty good bruise up there on your head that needs to be checked out. Where would you like for me to tell them that you would like to go? You know, is there somebody that you, who, who should we call first uh, to tell that, you know, your car is incapacitated, you're going to be late to work this morning, just, you know, you're going to be at the hospital for six months. Uh, but, but you're getting some kind of information. So if if this person does become unconscious, then uh, you've at least got that much information. Was there a thought? Uh, yeah. Maybe try to make the, the person as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they're shaking, you know, hold their hand. Or if they are... Okay, do you move them? Well, you don't move them if, if they're hurt in any kind of way whatsoever. Okay. You know. yeah, if they want to move themselves, 
that's their business. But you know, unless you are getting out, getting them out of the path of an oncoming train, uh, you can't stop traffic. Yeah, you know, the general rule. Although we've got good Samaritan laws that are helpful and, and protective to an extent, you need to be real careful about moving people because you may do more damage, more injury to them uh -oh, than initially. But certainly to stay calm. And as excitable as I am, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. But were you going to add something? Well, I was thinking both the, sometimes they're getting information and I think a lot of other things. <clears throat> sometimes if people, if there's a crisis, but you're waiting for the help or waiting for what can be done, sometimes the, a very calming thing is that you're giving someone a thing, something to do. I mean, I think in the classic, you know, the woman's having the baby, they always send the father off to go boil, you know, water. Yeah, or go <laughs> <and then laughs> boil water, water and get out of here. <laughs> you know, it wasn't necessarily because they needed anything boiled, but that was, it gave him something to do. And if you're talking to the person getting information, that's giving them something to do to, to get this, give you this information, to think about that, Good. not to be panicking. That leads into our last step there, which is get an action plan. And we'll pursue that more. Uh, next week, we'll talk more about stabilizing the situation, too. But figuring out what you can do, how many choices do we have, and, you know, how can we best handle those. Okay, I think we've got five or six minutes left here. If you're brave enough to walk up here, uh, you can see yourself on TV later, I'd like for you to introduce yourself to the rest of the class. Now, if you really prefer to stay where you are, well, that's okay. Be sure to push your mic button down so... Uh, Darren out there can hear everybody, uh, too. Darren, you want to start? Are you still listening? I'm still here. Okay, tell them who you are and whatever they should know that's memorable about you. Uh, I'm Darren Gorey. I'm out here all by myself, and I don't have to worry about body language or anything like that. <laughs> I'm real gas out here all by myself. <coughs> You're supposed to have some people with you. So Not we'll today. Not today, though. <laughs> okay, maybe they're just going to tape it off the TV. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's start here. You want to walk up here? Sure. sure. Uh, you can do this. <laughs> About 30 seconds each. That's all you got time for. <laughs> um, my name is Melanie Entwistle. I'm a senior. Um, graduating in May. Majoring in? Uh, speech communications is my major. And why are you in here? I've wanted to take this class for three years, and my schedule is never permitted because of the hours it was um, provided. But I am taking it now, and um, heard wonderful things about it. Okay, good. And um, so we'll see, huh? That's it. Okay, come on up, Carol. Nancy, you can get right behind her and be ready. My name's Karen Come Sets. on over. So we're, no, we don't want half of you on camera. Right. My name's Karen Setz. I'm also a speech communication major. I won't get to graduate this spring, but maybe, depending on the classes they offer, maybe this summer. And that'll be exciting because I've been waiting a long time for my degree. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning all kinds of things about, maybe especially for dealing crises with teenagers. Oh, okay. Okay, great. <clears throat> I'm Nancy Porter, and I actually had a crisis right in the middle of one, one of Dr. Hunt's classes. A <laughs> <laughs> little beeper just went off right in class. And uh, I'm just excited about taking this course. I work with a lot of teenagers in crisis, and I'm considering switching my major to speech communication. I'm at a point where I can do that. Okay, good. We'll get her converted. Julie, come on up. My name is Julie Rawlinson. Um, I'm a psych major and a speech minor. And I'm taking this course. I volunteer at a boys' home, and we deal with crisis situations all the time. And I'm hoping to learn how to better deal with it. Okay, good. We we'll look forward to your sharing experiences. Jason, you're next. You are going to have to comment tonight. That's right. <clears throat> I'm the infamous Jason Pryor. Uh, I'm a speech communications major, and I also compete on the University of Houston Forensics. And I'm taking this course for three hours credit. Okay. Great. Let's move over to Lara. Uh, my name is Lara 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 L
is Lara Haggerty, and I'm a speech communications major and minoring in business management. And uh, this course seems interesting, and I've had the teacher before, and uh, it's only one night a week. If I would have known I was going to be on TV, I would have worn something nicer. <laughs> <laughs> The guys would probably let you take it off, but <laughs> it's not that kind of class. Oh, okay. Uh, my name is John McCann. I'm a mathematics major and speech communication minor. I'm going to be graduating in May. And I only need two classes left, and this one fit my schedule, and that's one. Okay, great. Edna Lopez. I'm a senior. I'll be graduating in the fall. I'm um, a business administration major. <laughs> I'll be taking a minor in women's studies. So basically this class was just something that I really wanted to do because I have three younger sisters that live with me because my parents are going through a divorce. So anyway. Your life is a constant crisis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus I have a year old messy. My younger sister's baby. So. You're all under also. the same roof. Yeah. So, yeah. But you're the eldest of the four girls. <clears throat> and I'm Robert LaBavera, and I'm an elementary education major, and uh, my specialization is speech and history. And I'm presently in phase two, which is observation, and I'll be doing my student teaching next semester, which is fall of 95. Hopefully, I'll graduate <laughs> then. And I'll probably be teaching in the southwestern part of Houston, uh, Fort Bend County, Stafford area. Got a grade level preference? Fourth grade, fourth or fifth grade, so that's what I'm observing. You have lots of crises to deal with. I have a lot of crises to deal with. I do some computer classes for HISD. And gee, the elementary population is really interesting. <laughs> so, Ginger, you want to come up and tell them a little bit about you? We'll do some formal introductions on her later on. When you look at your syllabus, you'll see that there are a couple of topics mm. that we've got her assigned to. I participate at length, and we'll go into detail on that. But in your normal life, who are you? <laughs> my name is Ginger Yocum. I'm married. I have two kids. I have a daughter who's 13, <coughs> and a son who's 8. I'm a freshman here at the University of Houston, um, double majoring in psychology and communication, and I'm Dr. Hunt's ITV assistant. So if you guys have any problems, call me. And if I don't have the answer, I'll ask Dr. Hunt, and then I'm calling you back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. It's a purple. <laughs> That's right. And we were told not to clash with our visual aids. So, <clears throat> okay, if I can find the right visual here. Uh, let's go back and review just a bit. We'll be elaborating uh, on some of these items <coughs> next week. But uh, we said that we wanted to do three things when there is a crisis situation, that we want to clarify the crisis, stabilize the situation, and develop an action plan. And as we look at the different units that we're working with uh, this semester, as we get into specific topics, uh, we'll keep. Okay. Darren, if you ever can't read this out there, buzz in and let me know. Sometimes I forget to check the monitor. Uh, the first thing we're doing is figuring out, do we have an emergency? <laughs> Do we have an urgency, or do we have a real crisis situation that's going on here? Uh, if it's a crisis, is it a situational crisis? Is it a maturational crisis? Is it an existential crisis? Or is it some combination of those? And you can be reflecting between now and next week about different kinds of crises that fall into those categories, because one of the things we're going to do is start with preschoolers and try to crawl into the point of view of people who are two years old, Jason, or five years old, or who are teenagers, or young adults, or midlife crisis, or you know the geriatric set, you're, or uh, you're retired. Try, try to get within those different points of view. And so be thinking about if you know, the part you've lived through and what kind of crises you experienced at those levels, and then also be thinking through what you think might become a crisis as you grow older. 
most of you look pretty young to me. Uh, you know, but what do you anticipate uh, might be a crisis at a particular level? Uh, we're looking at mobility and lethality as factors in that. Uh, then the second thing we said we want to do is stabilize the situation. And the first thing we're going to do is check the scene to make sure that it's safe to proceed, do whatever we can to ensure safety, thus reducing lethality in that situation. And we want to have a calm response. And we'll be talking about empathy, professionalism, uh, those kinds of things later on, but we want a calm response. Then our third part is to develop an action plan. We'll get into that more later on too. But we'll consider how many choices that we have, apply criteria to that choice, uh, seek consensus. It would be nice if the people agreed with you and then work to implement whatever kind of an action plan you've adopted and follow up as appropriate. There are some situations where uh, once you're done, you're done. You know, you help the victims at an accident scene, uh, the paramedics transport them to the hospital, and you're done with it. Uh, there are other times that this is someone you know, and they've had a really bad day, and a nice thing for you to do might be to call that person uh, later in the evening, check up on them, uh, see how they're doing. Sometimes it's a note. Sometimes it's a phone call. Sometimes it's personal contact. That will vary according to the particular context and the particular situation. But you're clarifying the crisis. You're stabilizing the situation. You're developing an action plan. And as a consequence of that, hopefully you'll be a better caregiver. You'll be a better respondent in a situation. And as you look through and view the different uh, situations this semester, and we anticipate those, then that increases the number of response styles that you have available to you in a particular situation. Are there any questions? Okay, later on we'll be getting into more pragmatics of the course expectations about papers and so forth. And that yellow light finally quit blinking. <laughs> I think they need to give me one minute cues. <laughs> Jason's sitting back there laughing as I'm stretching. Mm -hmm.